we'll get underway with the Monday, February 22nd uh, workshop with the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Our agenda items today are number one, um, continuation and hopefully um, finalization of, uh, of our goals for this year. And then the second item is um, further discussion on the EPR information that was presented to us um, last month. So with that being said, um, do we have anybody? I can't see from this view. There we go, participants. Do we have anybody from the public that would like to speak about agenda item number one, our goals? I don't see any hands going up there. So um, where do you guys want to pick up the discussion? I know, you know, Penny, you had a, a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, I think that you wanted to, to bring back up. Do you want to lead off here or? Oh, I don't mind leading off. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I walked through the, um, uh, the whole document um, yesterday and um, I have a whole bunch of things. So I don't know if you want, it will take the first page that I'm on is the uh, town strategic map. Um, and uh, one of the things here is that I just wonder if we want to explicitly state up front that we're guided by the comprehensive plan. I think that uh, just based on um, feedback and comments and all the energy uh, around some of the uh, potential projects in town, um, I think that uh, to explicitly say that um, our work throughout this is guided by the, the comprehensive plan. So that's kind of my overarching comment. Um, uh, and then, then as I, I look at the uh, infrastructure bucket, um, this kind of links into, I don't know if you want to pop pages back and forth, but as I looked here and I saw infrastructure and we talk uh, traffic and parking and uh, we talk about cell coverage and stuff like that. Um, what I noticed is if we carry over to the goals and objectives on infrastructure, we explicitly pull out uh, climate change, but we don't explicitly pull out um, the, uh, the, the parking and um, uh, the traffic challenges, nor the uh, cell coverage and uh, impact on power outages. And I know that the impact on power outages and the cell coverage is something that that uh, pops up. And of course, the electrical piece when the power goes out. Uh, but definitely cell coverage is something that I think we need to have as a priority in our, um, in, in our infrastructure because it's a um, an impact to people who work from home. It's an impact to uh, just general uh, operations. So my question around that is, do we want to uh, somehow explicitly pull out the uh, cell coverage and um, power outages? So that's, that's my, my thread around infrastructure and um, if, sorry to jump all over the place. So my thread pulled through to um, uh, potentially helping a diverse community could be a place where we um, uh, uh, highlight more of the, the parking, the traffic and the, and the walkability. Uh, so uh, something could fit in there. Uh, the, the cell and the, um, uh, electrical piece, uh, definitely cell coverage, I think fits under uh, infrastructure and should get um, highlighted as, as much as we've highlighted climate change. So that's my first area. Did I talk too fast? Okay. No. Um, Did you? I mean, you know, first off, the point on the comp plan, I think is a good one. Um, and is, you know, I, I'm sure it's worth bearing repeating here. Um, 
so maybe we just fold that into, um, you know, touch on both the the one town concept and the comp plan as as you, you know. Oh, that's sort a cool being, idea. Um, yeah. Together. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, yep. that's a good idea. Initially, I thought of just having it as a blurb underneath uh, the town strategic map and just have a statement that says our strategies are guided by the comp plan or something like that. But um, I think the one town concept that could uh, uh, definitely uh, fit there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, like most of these things, Penny, I think that the question you raise, you know, let's take the cell phone stuff as an example is, um, you know, putting, putting a strategic uh, sort of stake in the ground around needing to solve for that problem, but then also being realistically cognizant of what we may or may not do this year towards advancing that, right? So um, right. if, if, that's not something that'll happen, you know, in a matter of days, weeks, or even probably months. So if, if the, if the marker for this year is, you know, figure out whether or not, you know, determine the viability of either, you know, attracting, uh, you know, some service provider to expand on the existing network in town, or I know we've talked about before previous, workshops and discussions around, you know, whether or not, you know, the town itself sets up one of these sort of micro cell networks, um, uh, you know, that, that other towns and communities are doing as well, not necessarily around Maine, but in other places, so. Right, but if we look at being guided by the comp plan, in a comp plan, we, we pulled, uh, highlighted the fact that uh, cell coverage and communications is something that needed to be addressed. And right, but what um, we didn't I don't I don't I don't have it right in front of me, but what I don't think we highlighted in the comp plan was what we were specifically going to do right. and when we needed we were going to, to do develop it. our strategy around yep. how to and yeah. yeah and so what I'm saying if if, if this is a, a goal plan for this year, what I'm just trying to be what I'm just trying to harness our focus around is what are the specific and concrete things that we realistically think we can do towards advancing that goal, not necessarily achieving that goal? I think it's unrealistic, for example, to think that by the end of 2021, as a result of, you know, our work and, and, and stuff like that, we're going to have expanded cell coverage. I think that's I probably say, unrealistic. Right. I would say that what we need is something along the lines of uh, the fact that we would gain an understanding of the existing challenges around uh, uh, cell and communication coverages, and that we would um, uh, either uh, initiate um, uh, work on um, how we would develop a plan around solving that. I think first we, we gain an understanding of the problem, then we set in motion um, how we want to attack that. So developing our, our strategies, our plan around that. I would say that Matt, that's 2021. Matt, do you want to weigh in? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, it may be helpful to the council uh, to know that uh, or one area that you may be able to make a significant gain or at least a gain in is the discussion of the 5G uh, system that's coming out with those micro installations that are having. Currently, the ordinance is silent towards that. Uh, so uh, one, I think it was like two years ago, possibly three was when uh, uh, they were initially looking at doing an installation in town and then uh, the operator decided not to do the installation. But uh, recently we've heard a couple of conversations where that may be coming uh, again uh, in into the view of the of the town. So that may be an area that you, you may want to uh, consider through the ordinance process as an amendment to the uh, to the cell tower regulations, or uh, at least find some language to insert uh, okay. related to that. That way, you can get, be ahead of the curve and ready uh, okay. for that when it does come for implementation. But do so you know, Matt? Even even with that advance in technology, <clears throat> is that going to is that going to solve the problem now? Is one of gaps. It's it's not. Yeah. So I, I know that the the five G is is 
a function of speed, not coverage, right? Right. I think so. Yeah. And, and, it, it, uh, you know, it's 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 how much information can flow through the the pipe, so to speak. And so I, I think I think the more central problem as it relates to coverage, uh, as it relates to service, is is one of of coverage, not quality of of speed or service on where there is coverage. Yeah, and so I, I like I know I know, you know, we've talked about before, even a local company like like Tilson Technology yeah. that has a you know has a product and a service where affixing to existing buildings or utility poles, they have basically relay responders. Um, right. it's, it's like those little micro cell boosters that people get in their homes, but on a more scalable yeah. level. And I mean, you know, so in theory, the town could, you know, as a, as a policy, we as the council could adopt a policy to say, hey, we, we think the town should invest in and um, build out our own infrastructure or what we've done to date is sit around and wait for other service providers to come in and ask to set up shop. And I guess I think I think several of us are wondering whether or not that waiting game is going to solve the problem fast enough. So, right, exactly. So, so I think the the key point is know the problem, know what uh, uh, potential what opportunities are out there, and. Uh, set a direction and 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 then if there are ordinance changes that are buried within there let's pull them out just like you say matt early on so that we're positioned for whatever uh solutions we choose to put in place because i i'm tired of waiting for somebody to solve the problem it's like come on let's solve the problem we're all smart people so let's figure it out so do you think under the 2021 goals area, we should put, you know, um, define the problem areas and potential solutions for solving this problem? And so that's like what we would do this year. Yeah, that's fine. And if there were some near term fixes you can put in place, I'm always a proponent of if you identify a quick hit along the way. Uh, make a decision and move on it. Um, but uh, yeah, we gotta we gotta like start, or otherwise we we can sit here for the next ten years and talk about all the wonderful solutions that are out there because we all know what's going on out there in the technology world. Um, so I I think it's something that we need to put at the top of our list. I, I, I was also I just, thinking while we were talking. Uh, oh, sorry. Jeremy, um, cellular and broadband, right? It's not just phones, it's also, okay. You got it, exactly, exactly. I think it's also the, I think it's also the power reliability too, um, Nicole, because I mean, fr fr frankly speaking, you know, on that one, I got a pretty, I got a pretty weird grasp on what the problem is, <laughs> at least from a functional perspective. But what I don't have a good grasp on is sort of what our, what our, what the lever, levers we can pull are, to kind, of, you know, that's where, that's where I think we need some, some help understanding, you know, what the policy options are. The electrical one, the electrical one. On on all three, but you know, especially on the the electrical. I mean, like. That that's pretty well documented where where and when that problem occurs. Um, right. It's more a question right. of what we do about it. Right. Valerie, right. I, I just just one second, Valerie. So the one thing I just want to distinct have distinction on between the cellular problem. I, I know that like at a state level, when we talk about it, you know, broadband and rural access and stuff like that is is I, I don't think access to broadband in our community is uh uh urgent problem. I think, I think there's availability of service. And if I, I know more and more people obviously are reliant upon broadband, whether they be working from home or going to school from home or what have you, but if, if the power's out, there's nothing that we're doing. There's nothing that we can do that corrects that disconnected broadband problem. Yep. The cellular <laughs> thing is different because we, we, we have areas of town where 
the, either the, the, there's non-existing coverage or the coverage is really, really poor. Um, so I think, I think that's more of an access issue. Valerie, you were gonna say something? Yeah, um, my thought is, it sounds like we need to set up one of our workshops to just go through a lot of these goals and figure out some actions. Because I'm thinking that this is something our energy committee could handle, that they could research it, they could determine what's a priority and then get back to us so that we, we would have that information. You don't think so, Penny? I, I see her kind of shaking her yeah. head. But I, I, think just, you, I think you hire, I think you hire at some point, hire a consultant to do, to, to do the assessment. We've been kicking this around for so many years. I think we probably are at that point. Okay. So not to beat a dead horse, but again, with this comment or, or any others, Penny, I, I just want to make sure, <clears throat> pardon me, with the what's captured in the goals here that we, we remain realistic about what, how much we can move the needle on this particular item or others like this, um, you know, in, in this year that these goals uh -huh. relate to. So well, separate, just what... separating out the comp plan being you know, the longer range, you know, goal that, okay, what, what are we doing this year to, to accomplish this? So. I don't disagree. That's where, yep. I, you know, as I was going through this, I'd say, okay, yep. we, we got to prioritize these things. And I have to tell you, and I, I'm really a climate change advocate, uh, but I'm also a communications advocate and I'm tired of not being able to do business across town. It's crazy. So mm -hmm. if I had to prioritize of where I would put energy and dollars, I would say, let's get that problem fixed and let's move on because that one's easy uh, somewhat. The yeah. climate change one is a long-term one that we commit to year over year over year over year. So anyway. Did you want me to keep going or you want somebody else? Uh, you can, or I, so the, the view that I have right now, everybody, I, 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 I have to keep thumbing through to see who's, who's talking and, or who, who's interested to talk. So, I mean, feel free to chime in if, if folks have something. So, okay. But if you want to go, oh, go ahead, Valerie. Yeah. I just want to say, um, Penny was just talking a little bit about climate change. Um, I agree that it's definitely a goal that we're going to have to work on year in, year out. However, I feel like we, we need to set some sort of a goal, whether it's reducing our carbon footprint by 50% or 100% by 2050, we need to set some sort of a goal so that we know what, what we're working on. If we just say we have a goal to have an action plan, what are we really working on? And, and again, maybe this is something that we all sit down and talk about, or we send to the conservation committee or the energy committee to help create an action plan. But I really feel like we need, we need to say what our, our goal is. And Jamie, you had talked about joining Portland and South Portland. I looked up um, their plan, which is fabulous and we might be able to join it, but it seems that we still need a goal. Um, even if we do join them? I would say that one of the things that we need to think about or consider is the plan uh, and the strategies and the direction that's coming down from uh, the state. And that we look at that plan and we identify how we may pull those threads uh, in order to achieve certain goals. So I, 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 I in agreement with, with you, Valerie, but I think, um, I think we want to uh, pull the state's plan down. We need to look through it, see how we might apply it. And, uh, and yeah, talk to our neighboring communities, but um, 
I, I'm really a believer that if, uh, if Janet is trying to set some direction, we maybe want to um, uh, take a look at it. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, I agree. And I think um, I agree with that. And I think the first task that we've got under this of creating a climate goal, I think if we, we could just make that a little bit more specific to something like develop a local climate action plan with ambitious carbon reduction goals. And we could even reference the the main, what is it, main weight or whatever the name of the- Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, I just think that there's very little at this point having done almost no work on it. I think there's very little that we could put into this annual goal plan that would be at all informed by anything other than us just spitballing or, you know, like to say, let's yep. reduce this by exactly. 50% or well, why not 40% or why not 75%? Like, I mean, there's, we have, we have no information other than us just saying, you know, we feel like we should have a goal. I think, I think, I think the, the first step on this monumental climb is, you know, actually just figuring out what makes sense for our community and, um, you know, what path to follow for that. And that, that's frankly going to be some of the harder work than just us throwing out a number today, just to throw, throw into this, onto the slide. That's all. I'm going to take out this one here to seek to reduce energy consumption because I think it's all kind of in this one. So just in case you're like, why is that going? That was away? my next point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Valerie, does does that language that's up there now does that address your your um, you know the point you were just bringing up? Yes, definitely. I just my concern is that we say create. Um, climate goals, um, I, I think we really need an action plan and we really need to say we're going to sit down and do it or we're going to have um, our energy committee present one present some research to us on a climate action plan, something to where we're actually moving forward with it. And, and that looks great. I'm just saying that I'd, I'd like to see us this year set up sometime where we talk about it because in the last three years we we haven't done much on it i like the idea of having a workshop where we go through these okay what's what's our action item like what's the first action item for this goal and that's more of like the spreadsheet view of okay is this project green yellow or red um but i, I like that idea because otherwise they will just be words on a page. How do they get off the page and into action? Yeah, thanks, thanks for Lori. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if I could uh, add Go another ahead. item. Uh, thank you. Uh, just the, the one other portion under climate change may be the installation of the two electric vehicle charging stations. They might they might jump in on that on that area as well. Mm -hmm. What's the latest on that, by the way? Well, we have received uh, up to six uh, sixteen thousand dollars up to that, or eighty percent of the cost for both. Uh, for both, so we received both grants uh, from from Efficiency Maine, and uh, it, it's in the uh, budget. You'll see it shortly in the uh, capital projects for uh, fiscal year 22. Uh, so we'll have a number in there to offset the difference between uh, what we anticipate the pricing will be. But we're going to be going out to bid here shortly as well uh, to get a, a, a better number uh, to know what that gap will be, and so we can firm that up by the end of the budget season.
Do you want some more? <laughs> Go right ahead. Okay. Um, before we start some more, oh. the traffic and parking challenges, are we leaving it here in the infrastructure? There's talk of maybe I, moving I that? think this is my opinion. Um, I think I think it goes under providing a health, uh, safe and healthy homes and neighborhoods because that's where streets and parking and traffic and and maybe it doesn't, but um, I, I I like it better there than uh, parking everything under infrastructure, no pun intended. Um, but I can be swayed either either way because I initially put it under infrastructure, but then I thought that was getting a little too busy and did it fit someplace else. This is Gretchen. I would just say, I, I wonder if it depends on our intent. If we're talking about walkability, I might put it under healthy community, but if we're talking about safety and intersections and things like that, it might stay under infrastructure. So I'm not exactly sure what we had in mind when we said traffic challenges, but that would be my I think we, we, have our, we have our corner up here where all the accidents happen all mm -hmm. the time. <laughs> I, I only saw one this weekend, but um, so um, yeah. To, to, I, to that end, if, if I may uh, jump in mm -hmm. for a moment. Uh, thank you. Um, we do have a presentation queued up uh, to be performed by uh, Tom Errico, uh from TYLN uh, from the from the uh, town center inter intersection study that he's performed. Uh, so he's got that uh, report ready to go. So we're looking to have that probably as March's uh, agenda is looking uh, to be getting getting populated quickly. We'll probably try to get Tom in for April. So do we want it under infrastructure? Because then it covers it covers all aspects, not just neighborhoods. It sounds like it would stay under infrastructure if we're talking about um, traffic studies and. Uh... Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. It doesn't fit in any other category, so we might as well keep it there. Okie dokie. Cool. <clears throat> okay. Um, the next one I had, hold on just a second here. I gotta go to. Um, that was just a personal comment. Okay, under natural and uh, cultural resources, this one, I, this may sound a little uh, uh, far reaching. Um, but I truly think that we need to make sure ordinances do not encumber the ability for people to produce food. So where we say support farming uh, and locally grown food, I really think we need to say to support food production from a commercial and a personal uh, basis or something along those lines. I can, I can work on the words and send it to you, Nicole, but I think it's about uh, everybody should be able to produce food. And, um, and yes, I love farms. And yes, I want to highlight farms, but I, uh, my whole thing is about producing food. So that's just my thought on that one. Is there something that's hindering that today? No, but I don't. I don't want things to hinder it. Um, I would say, you know, we had our little chicken ordinance or rooster ordinance, you know, um, and uh, but I think this is about food production, and um, and we. I want us to value our farms because it is something that we do today. Um, but I don't think what we do today is highlight the fact that uh, uh, we want to support food production from a, um, a commercial and personal perspective. And, um, and so if we say commercial, to me, that's a farm. So we don't even need that first statement. 
I was putting them side by side so we could read them together. But that's um, just my that's just my perspective. I like where you're going with that. My one concern is if the public is reading this, would they know what food production means when someone's thinking about like their backyard garden or something? Do they immediately put those terms together? No. Um, maybe. Um, maybe that's part of the education. But you can leave it how you could leave it how it is. It's not one of those things that's going to keep me awake at night. Well, it makes but me think I, about the um, like the pesticide thing. I mean, that could fall under that as a goal, right? We need to look at if pesticides are allowed because we need to support commercial and residential food production. So I, I like where it's going. My only concern was just, would people understand what that meant if they were yeah. reading it? Yeah. I, I, um, I kind of like the support farming and locally grown food. I know where you're going with that, um, Penny, and but I like um, the simplicity of um, locally grown food um, rather than uh, commercial production. Um, that sounds to me like it could be a big factory with- um, That's what a farm is. Like, uh, well. But anyway, I. I will save that one for another year because I think it's, I think we really need to start educating people around, uh, I'm gonna throw this out, food sovereignty. And uh, you don't hear many uh, uh, commercial growers in support of that, I'm in support of all people being able to produce their food. Whether you sell it or not is another thing, but everybody should be able to produce their food. So anyway, we can move on from that one. Then my next thing is, what is encourage historic preservation? I need to have a few more words around that because those kind of things make me nervous because it says something about uh, accreditation or recognition or visibility or those kind of things. So I'm wondering what it is. I, I think that we put that in there because I was talking about um, National Historic Landmark status. Uh-huh. Is that why we had it? Um, because um, Portland Headlight, Fort Williams aren't on our National Historic Landmark designation. And um, we have things like uh, Portland Observatory, Camden Public Library. And it was something that I had thought um, we might wanna look into that. Mm -hmm. So should we mm -hmm. change preservation to designation with that? Well, and I think the, the question for me then is if this is if this is really a Fort Williams Portland headlight thing, then maybe that falls under the I, I know um, from following the the master the Fort Williams Park plan <laughs> process um, that his you know preservation of historic resources in the fort is a big feature of that planning process and and one that I think will be fairly prominent and I think we could relatively easily. Uh, you know, provide some direction to the Fort Williams Park Committee that they look at, you know, some of the potential designations that we could be incorporating into the plan as part of that process. If this is bigger than Fort Williams, you know, if we're looking at other structures in other parts of town under, under this verbiage, then I think probably it might make more sense as, as a pullout. But I don't know if that if this was intended to be bigger than Fort Williams or if this is intended to just focus on those structures. Well, if we if we wanted to look at um, 
the meeting house or spur Wink school, something like that, then we may want to include them as national um, historic landmarks or even include them on the uh, national historic register, um, national register of historic places. Uh, there's so many different um, historic um, designations. I have a question though. To what end? Well, um, I think that I, you know, I really feel that um, these places are significant, especially Portland Headlight. And I think that having it at, designated a National Historic Landmark is important. And it's honoring of, um, of Fort Williams and the, uh, the Headlight. Huh, I think the Headlight gets a lot of recognition already as uh, out in the world. I'm just, I'm, I'm just uh, probably a little uh, cautious because, um, and I come at it from a, a maybe a different perspective, is that uh, uh, I, 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 I want to try to balance what, what we have to offer with what we want to retain as a community. And I think the more uh, visibility that you put out there, uh, the more we're creating uh, 40,000 cars in Fort Williams or 250,000 cars. And uh, we already have that number of cars going in there. Um, how, how much bigger, how much more visibility do you want it to get? And maybe I'm being a, a protectionist of some sort, but that's how I, that's how I feel. If you guys want to travel down the path, um, I'm, I'm not going to try to hinder it, but uh, I won't support it. So what's well, here for the goal is just evaluate the requirements and stuff like that. I, 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 I don't, I'm not personally clear on purpose and, 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 right. and outcome. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with pursuit of it, if, if that's what makes sense. I, I just sitting here tonight, I don't, I don't even know what that does, what that encumbers us uh, with or, or what kind of protections it affords or all that kind of thing. So <clears throat> I think if the goal is simply to evaluate the requirements and, and consider the opportunities, then that's fine. It's it, I I don't think the goal, as at least written here, is saying, you know, apply for or achieve or, you know, any of those things. Yeah, these these seem much more preliminary in nature to me. But right. and I like I said, I I don't know. You know, with the lighthouse being held in trust, um, I I I, don't, I like I literally just don't know the mechanics of what's involved and 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 all that kind of stuff. So. Matt, go ahead. If it may be helpful, I know uh, with the headlight itself, uh, there are restrictions that do exist there. Uh, if you may recall, when we did the pedestrian improvement project last year, we had to have that reviewed by the uh, uh, by Earl Shuttleworth, I believe, at the main. Uh, uh, and Jeremy can probably help me on this. I always mess it up, but I think it's a historical reservation society. Uh, uh, of the state. Commission. Oh, commission, thank you. And uh, so close. Uh, but uh, I know that we had to have them approved on that. and. Uh, uh, there was areas that they would let us do, but other areas that they, they had placed restrictions on. So that specific, that uh, carve out piece right there that already is under uh, under some restrictions uh, for that. But the rest of the park, uh, I do not believe has a designation uh, when it comes to that outside of uh, the preservation that the town has, uh, has done throughout the years to maintain the properties. But the only other challenge that I would just uh, state is, you know, some concern when you do when you do have uh, that designation placed on there, there are oftentimes uh, restrictions that may come into place as far as materials and construction techniques that may be employed to maintain a building. Uh, and, and that may come into play, uh, but it, I know it comes into play when you do pursue uh, funding or grant, grant opportunities for say preservation, where you have to go and use say, for instance, certain window types and certain, uh, Certain materials where you may not use modern, uh, uh, like like say for instance on the porches on the officers' row buildings, you 
may not be able to use pressure tree of the lumber you'd have to use a different form of lumber or uh, you wouldn't be able to use treks where that might be a you know a composite decking versus uh cedar or something like that but those are i mean that's that's further down the road but that's just uh, some elements that you may want to to consider So um, instead of encourage historic preservation, then maybe we're talking more about um, explore it. There you go. Well, I was going to suggest that on this front page here that we do something that's a little broad that includes just sort of preserving and protecting the history of our town. So that could be the, the oral history of the town, the stories, the, it could be the buildings. Um, it could be other cultural sites, I don't know. Um, and then when we get into the specific projects, we could say something like explore, you know, a formal historic preservation designation for important buildings or something like that. But I would like to see something on this page that just kind of is a little more all-encompassing because the history of our town's really important and it's not just buildings. So maybe we could put something that's a little broader. Yeah, yeah, like, like the that. perfect phrase, and I, I need I like to transcript. <laughs> I, I'd agree with that. And I know, in addition to Fort Williams, another one of the other sites that a uh, neighbor uh, recently brought up with me is the, um, the there's a small cemetery um, on the former town farm site um, that, you know, could use a little bit of attention. Um, and so I think there, you know, that. I think looking at that and kind of evaluating our options for, you know, preserving and promoting that part of town history um, would fall under this as well, potentially. I think that's a great idea. I just wish I captured what you first said because it was <laughs> just the right phrase. Yeah, I don't remember, sorry. <laughs> I'll watch the replay and get it in there. I'll, I'll put a note for myself. 748 mark. Do, do. Let's see, I have did that one, did that one. Okay. Are we set for another one? Cool, okay. Go down to natural and cultural resources under goals and objectives. And I really wanna highlight this. This is the, and I don't care what we call it, but the don't trash on tape. I am so fed up with masks and gloves and cups and, um, uh, containers on the sides of the road that I think that, you know, I, I keep thinking back to the, what was it, the 60s, the beautification of America here, um, that we got to start highlighting again to not throw stuff out onto the streets. It's not somebody else's responsibility to pick up after you. And that the uh, number of and I know all the dog people um, say that this doesn't happen, but the number of little doggy bags around here and there um, are, are more than what uh, one would expect. Um, so I really think that we have an opportunity, and I don't know whether this fits with um, uh, uh, recycling or who it fits with, are, uh, but it fits somewhere that we've got to start saying to people, you gotta, we got to keep our streets clean. We shouldn't have to pay people to go around town picking up trash. And so this is my, it, it, it's just driving me crazy. Um, so I really want to, uh, in 2021, start highlighting to people that uh, we need to keep our streets clean and we all have a responsibility to do it. 
and, uh, and as well as the trails. Um, so that's why I came up with Don't Trash Tape as my uh, slogan. And I think we could ask Cumbies to help because the number of Cumbies containers is really fascinating. And Nips bottles. Oh, oh, it used to be Nips bottles were the number one thing. Now it's masks. It's crazy. But <laughs> yeah, I know the American Recycling Committee had the plogging week and the first official plogging week, it rained the entire week of April. And so I think that put a, a hinder on that first year, but well, I but think that, this could that, play in well with yeah. that. Like this could promote that as sanctioned events that everyone but should you know what that, doing. What that does, and I, I was supportive of that, but that's still asking someone to pick up your trash. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, maybe we still have to do that, but uh, I, I really think that, uh, yeah, leverage that and create some sort of campaign that says, don't trash Kate. The stuff that blows out of your car on the way to the dump. Oh my God, Spurrick Avenue, it's crazy. Um, so I just think we need to start putting it out there. Maybe we could have it flash on the website, don't trash on Kate. So there's one. Uh, and then I could have more, but I will, uh, the rest are just kind of editorial comments, but those were my things that I wanted to ask about and talk about. Are there other big specific things that either folks see as missing or in need of sort of substantive revision? I just, I see a small, on the first page, we can go back. Um, oh, and I'm not that, there we go, under education and continuous learning. The last, um, we say seek opportunities to provide learning opportunities. Um, opportunity. yep. Yeah, so I thought maybe we could reword that a little bit. All right, we have possibilities. So we can seek possibilities or provide learning possibilities. Can't we just say provide learning opportunities for all citizens? Yeah. yeah. We don't. That's, yeah. That's the intent. <laughs> Go. It's easier. Yeah. If I if I may jump in for yep. a moment, I, I think that uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's I think that's a great uh, broad statement there that can be applied across multiple vehicles from the town side as well, uh, from community Ooh. services to the library. Uh, quite frankly, to the recycling committee, uh, there's multiple different areas that you can apply that to. So, the broadness of that statement, I think we can, uh, as far as staff and implementing it, I think we can find elements that will work within that as well. So that. That's great. I did have one more, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, this is under uh, Save at Healthy Homes and Neighborhoods. Actually, it's Healthy Community. And um, the way I worded it is leverage the knowledge of town departments to dig under the covers uh, of some hidden needs of our citizens. Um, and that's really something that uh, I think Matt could um, uh, talk to department heads about because uh, there are needs of citizens that we don't always hear about because they aren't going to come forward themselves, but there are departments such as um, uh, fire rescue police and probably even, uh, probably even public works 
might know of something, some need out there that we should be aware of and address. Um, Because we do have uh, couch surfers and homeless people and all kinds of things, just not of the magnitude of other communities. If I I may uh, jump in on that as well, Mr. Chairman. Um, Go ahead. Thank you. I I agree with you, Penny, and I think that's a great opportunity there too. Case in point was uh, work that was done by the police department during, uh, you know, actually since the advent of the COVID uh, experience in our in, our, in the community, it's finding uh, you know at risk folks, and you know especially some many of our seniors who were looking at social isolation, and you know reaching out to them from wellness checks to running, you know, going to the grocery store, picking up prescriptions, picking up groceries. They did yeoman's work, uh, especially on the PD side. Darren Estes uh, organized a lot of that work and it was a huge, uh, huge win for the, for the huge win for folks who received those services because uh, it just, it was really creative and, uh, and just shows that as well as, you know, work that Dave Galvin has done in the schools and identifying as at-risk youth. So a lot of those elements could be could be found here as well. So I, I think we can we can definitely work with that within that. You know, to even our assessor uh, finding folks who are having a hard time paying yeah. property taxes and and working on uh, you know programs like the property tax uh, relief program that the council has has brought forward and funded. So uh, there's a lot of good things there that can fall under that element as well. I had a couple of questions, if it's an okay time to yep. jump with them. Um, both on the under goals and objectives on the page that has fiscal responsibility and diverse communities. Um, so one, one question or thought that I had, um, so looking at promoting healthy homes and neighborhoods, um, the second bullet is resolve issues relative to short-term rentals. <laughs> um, I think perhaps a more realistic wording of that might be to short-term rental ordinance revisions and and monitor their implementation or something along those lines. That's a good one, Jeremy. <clears throat> good catch, I like that. Um, and then the other one that I had is the last bullet on, on the other side of the page under maintain fiscal responsibility and balance <clears throat> town priorities. Um, and I, this is really more of a question. Um, the last bullet there is to maintain the municipal bond rating to ensure capital needs can be met on, a fav- on favorable terms. I just wanted to make sure that um, you know, my understanding was, my understanding is that we have a very good bond rating and that, you know, as we take on additional debt, you know, that may influence our bond rating going forward. And I just wanted to make sure that the, you know, if this wording is intended to make sure that our our bond rate, you know, whatever borrowing we does maintains the highest bond rating, that that's what we actually want to be doing. Um, I, I think there's some potential that if we take on, you know, the the level of 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 debt that may be needed for some of the school, that we would potentially bump us down. Is that right, Matt? Into into a slightly lower bond rating. I. And so, yeah, I just want to make sure that the wording is in line with where the intended actions may be going. It, it, or at least, that, yeah, there is that potential uh, to, to your question, but uh, it's speculative. Uh, you know, uh, one way to describe that. Uh, but I think I'm trying to think about what might be a better way to word that. Uh, my understanding when drafting this was that it was meant like maintain the ratings we have now. So when we are going to borrow, we borrow at the best rates, not borrow and then bring it back up to the best level, which assumes that you aren't borrowing because right. that, I don't think we can do anything about that. And, and if that's the intent, I, I'm fine with that. I just wanted to make sure that we under the wording that I understood what the wording where where the wording is going Uh, you know I 
And I, I, I fully support, you know, I think we should be paying attention to our bond ratings and making sure that we, you know, are being fiscally responsible and, you know, borrowing on the best possible terms. Um, but I also don't want this wording to be used, you know, to, to foreclose options that may. Does that help maintain municipal bond ratings to ensure capital needs can be met on favorable terms when borrowing is required? I think that, I think that, prob yeah, I think that addresses my, yeah, I, I, I think that that works for me. I, yeah. This note that we had from before about looking out for the whole citizen, I feel like if we include this part here, that we're kind of getting into that, which we didn't really know how to articulate before. So I feel like they go together. And my so my only last other comment is on the next page under national natural and cultural resources is just to suggest that we might put a verb um, in with the Fort Williams master plan. I think complete would be an appropriate verb. <laughs> what is the timing for when that's intended to be done? Um, my understanding from the last meeting is that they, the um, consultants will be presenting their recommendations to the Fort Williams Park Committee at their March meeting with a goal of revising those, taking them out for public comment, and then coming back to the council uh, probably in June or July with a, a draft document to review. Okay. If people are interested in, in circling in sooner than that, um, I think that March um, Fort Williams Park Committee meeting might be a good place to get us a, a sneak preview of where some of the recommendations are headed. Okay. I saw that I, I was on for most of the beginning of the meeting when they were rolling out the presentation of the results and stuff like that. So from the, from the data gathering. The, I believe the timeline is still to have the, the, um, the plan completed by the end of the year. And I think a, a July presentation, June or July presentation of the draft will keep us on, on timeline for that. So are we feeling close to complete on this? Yep. Okay. So the plan will be then to um, uh, just have this as an agenda item uh, at our March meeting uh, to vote on approval of, so. Yeah. And if there's anything anybody thinks about between now and then, you know, whether it be just a different way to word something or, you know, feel free to send that over to Nicole directly if you want. Thanks, Nicole, for all your work on this. It's fantastic, it's great. Thank all of you for making it an awesome living, breathing document we can work on every six did, months, because that's a goal. And I, I think we've just really set up a really good framework here for, too. for um, Excellent. going forward, too. So um, this will have a lot of value beyond, obviously, just this year. So OK, does anybody have anything else they wanted to talk about in relation to goals?
All right. Uh, the next item then is discussion of the EPR resolution. Is um, let me just check if there's anybody that wants to speak about this from the public. Uh, got a few people with us. Um, if you're interested in commenting on this, you can raise your hand in the Zoom function of the meeting. Or if not, if you're just here to listen, that's fine too. We have three people with us right now. Um, so, um, Councillor Devereaux had uh, reached out to Matt and I with an interest in in getting this onto the March agenda, which I'm not necessarily opposed to. But um, since we only just had the the presentation from Chrissy um, Adamowitz uh, at our at our last meeting and, and hadn't had any opportunity to discuss it, I just asked that. We bring it to this um, forum first for for folks to have a chance to discuss and react to and all that kind of stuff. So, um, Councilor Devereaux, if, if 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 you wanted to start us off, that's fine. Or or not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Well, I I just um, thought it was a fabulous presentation. I think it's um, a wonderful resolution. I'd really like to see us behind it and join in with other towns that are um, supporting this resolution. Jeremy? I was just curious, um, either Jamie, you or, or Matt, um, if there's been any discussion around this through EcoMain and, and whether or not um, they have a physician legislation. Yeah. That was my question. Yep. There has been, Matt, if you wanna go first, go ahead. Um, I can weigh in too. Sure, thank, thank so you, Mr. Ahead. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I spoke with Chrissy uh, Adamowitz about uh, this in advance, uh, or, uh, in advance of tonight's discussion. Uh, she indicated that EcoMaine had uh, testified in favor of the bill uh, last year when it was in front of the legislature. And then I followed up with a co telephone call to Kevin Roach, uh, EcoMaine's uh, director. And uh, they're in favor of it in principle. Uh, the only, uh, you know, they definitely want any opportunity to find uh, you know, recycling to take place and to re remove that waste, and then as well as look at the responsibility uh, of the of the producers uh, and getting getting them within there instead of the towns, you know, basically shouldering the burden. Their concerns is just uh, you know the devil's in the details, I guess, like yeah. anything else. But but otherwise, uh, they're in favor of the concept. Uh, it's just a question of making sure that the situation is in place that they can find a way to. Uh, to make sure that the products do get uh, turned back and uh, and accounted for accordingly, but uh, overall, uh, they think it's a it's a good thing. I, I, my my general impression is that some of the more limited extended producer responsibility laws that we have in the state around you know paint disposal and and the bottle bottle bill is not actually all that limited. It's fairly widespread. Um, have worked really well, and and I think this seems like a, a wise policy move. Um, so I, I'm I'm supportive of 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 this effort. I think it fits in well with what we're trying to do in terms of boosting our town recycling rates as well. Yeah, uh, speaking with Kevin about that as well. The bottle bill is a great example of how that worked out. Um, there were uh, the one concern there is uh, you know how they manage getting all the different products uh, back, I guess, and that, the logistics of that. So if you have, you know, a number three plastic and that you need to take that to this location, if you have a number five, it needs to go here. Uh, but he thinks that, you know, that's something that, you know, if we can do bottles uh, <laughs> and other products that, that are there, then, then it can also be accomplished. Well, I, I think too, that this is, um there are 40 countries who have already approved this type of legislation. And we're looking at um, a resolution to encourage our state legislature to go forward with this. Maine would be um, a leader in the United States in um, creating this type of a ordinance or law regulation. So um, I, I think it's really forward thinking and kind of where we, want to go with some of our climate action goals. And then Christy's last yeah. point that she brought up to me too was it's an opt-in 
for towns uh, versus being mandated so that having the opt-in side of it still allows towns to have that autonomy if they do want to participate or not. Sorry, Mr. Yeah, I, I, I jump on you. No, I, I just wanted to clarify too. I mean, this is, we, we've had a few other things come before us in the last several years that are, you know, in the same vein as this, not necessarily the same topic, but um, where, you know, the council is being asked to sign on to a resolution that, you know, joins us with other towns in demonstrating our support for a concept, but it doesn't in any way bind us necessarily to any specific um, action or, um, you know, protocols or anything like that. You know, we did this with the climate, the carbon climate pledge. Um, you know, it, you, you're ba we're basically lending our voice to try and, you know, obviously encourage the policymakers and the legislators to, um, you know, to take action. But whether it be the, the carbon pledge we did or the raise the floor uh, on the school funding that we were looking at um, and all that kind of, I mean, I, th I think these are of, of, of a similar, um, you know, similar requests. And um, I'm not, I don't have any reservations about expressing the town's uh, policy support for something without you know, obligating us to any particular set of um, requirements, I guess is the best way to put it. I will say on the recycling committee, we reviewed it in its first draft form like a year and a half ago when we had so many questions about the details and what it would involve and how are small businesses going to be impacted and all of that. And so um, she actually came and did the presentation for us back in, I believe, November or October. And uh, we had some technical difficulties, so we couldn't actually see the slides. She just spoke through them, uh, but it answered all of those questions that we had had the year prior where it was just kind of being introduced. And so they had responses for how, you know, it would probably opt out almost all of the businesses in Maine, those small businesses that couldn't comply with it or in some ways already are. And so I feel like between where it was in the first form where I think we actually recommended to the town council, like this is great, we're keeping knowledge on it, but no action to take now um, to now where it's, you know, Portland, Scarborough, South Portland, Yarmouth, uh, Lewiston, Falmouth, all these towns have signed on. They've answered all those questions we had initially. So um, I definitely think it's a step in the right direction. And I love what Valerie said about it, putting Maine as a leader in this area across the country. Is there any opportunity for us to hear from the recycling committee between now and our March meeting? Uh, will they have a meeting that they, where they could discuss this? They usually meet the first Thursday of the month. So I think so. I have, um, uh, I understand conceptually uh, what we're trying to, what's trying to be accomplished here. Um, I, I guess I look at it from uh, multiple directions. Um, and I think everybody has played a role in um, creating the packaging we have today, creating the amount of uh, over packaging. Uh, consumers asked for it. Consumers needed to have things wrapped in plastic so that you couldn't uh, cut yourself with the knife that was in the store, uh, that you couldn't get to the uh, screwdrivers uh, and, um, and, and hurt somebody, uh, that we all shop uh, online and get an overabundance of uh, packaging and waste, uh, that we need to have things uh, packaged in order that they can't be tampered with. Uh, uh, we've We've created that. And so when I hear this, and, I, I, and I'm not saying that uh, uh, we, we shouldn't all play a role in, um, in paying for the recycling of what consumers have asked for, but um, 
this is a feel good thing to me. And logically, if you unravel it, um, it's, it's really about how does the consumer, and this is where I come from, how does the consumer push back and start saying, I don't need that packaging anymore. I'm not gonna shop online anymore. I'm not gonna do these things. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm, I'm torn as to where my vote would go. I will listen. I think there's a lot of details here that um, I, I tried to kind of kick the tires on, but I don't think they've gotten down into those details of how you're actually going to implement this. And the other thing I often get concerned about is that uh, at some point, they're going to put a dollar figure on the, on the businesses that will um, um, have to uh, adhere to a certain set of rules. It's gonna start with big corporations uh, the John Deere's and the Nestle's and the et cetera of the world. But once the trains left the station, it can go to some uh, other businesses that are not the billion dollar businesses, but are the, um, you know, the $10 million businesses. So I were, I just look at it and I, it gives me this uh, feeling of angst at this point in time. So I'm thinking about it. I read the article you sent Jamie. Um, and, um, and so people know that things need to happen. Uh, but that's uh, kind of where I'm at at this point in time. So we as consumers have a responsibility. Yeah, I do think that they tried to address that in some ways by encouraging the municipalities, whatever credit you get, put it into programs like don't trash cape, right? Reduce, yeah. reuse, like don't even get to the recycle, reduce, reuse. So if the funding coming in goes to things like that, maybe we can change the consumer behavior. And the one thing that I looked at with the, um, the corporation perspective is that if this sets up this like third party consultant office basically who's experts in packaging and sourcing and the materials maybe if it gets to that point of the 10 million dollar and lower businesses we've got this office that we can turn to where we don't have to hire a consultant to help us do this work we can go to the state and say you have an office that has all of this knowledge help me fix my supply chain and make it better without costing a ton of money so that's the one piece that I really like to see in they weren't just thinking of let's tax the big guys. They were, they were also trying to combat the problem from many root causes. So I appreciated that effort that they put in because in the first drafts of that, it did not exist. I guess Penny, just to address what you were saying too, I, I understand and, and you know, to, to be quite honest and, you know, having sat at the Legislative Policy Committee of MMA last year and you there now, I mean, I, I would be really surprised if this frankly goes anywhere. Um, but again, to the point I was making, comparing it to other similar things that we've been asked to voice our support for, uh, we're, we're, again, like I said before, we're not obligating ourselves to anything at this yeah. point. So yeah. if, if, if we're just raising our voice to say, yes, we agree that this is a problem that needs addressing, I, I, don't, I don't know that I have a ton of concern about what, what that may or may not be locking us into at this point. But Matt, did you wanna add something? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank, thank you. Uh, just uh, one point that you may want to consider uh, in the discussion is, uh, is packaging has has already uh, adapted to one uh, restriction that has been put into place in polystyrene. You know, you convert Duncan to paper cups and Cumbies to paper cups, and Hannaford's to uh, to non polystyrene uh, packaging. Uh, there are, you know, I guess you could say industry finds a way or business finds a way, especially on a larger scale, to to adapt and uh, maybe new opportunities may be found, but. Uh, it's, I guess it's not without precedent and, and there have been improvements that have come as a result of it. Uh, and uh, just yeah, in, the, in the universe of 
resolves that have been brought forward to council, this is probably one of the easier lifts that you'll probably come across in 2021. <laughs> Go ahead, Gretchen. Yeah, uh, I'll just say I, I definitely had some questions um, along the lines of, you know, whether there are going to be any unintended consequences, especially around um, whether this has any kind of deterrent towards just reducing packaging overall or making biodegradable packaging, that kind of stuff. Um, I had some questions about exactly what our obligations would be and the cost associated with that as a town. But I do think, Jamie, I agree with you that, you know, we would just be expressing our support for this general concept and we can worry about the, de the details of it later. And if, you know, we saw things concerning that came up as they were building the legislation, then we could, you know, work with our representatives or through the main municipal association or something to get those addressed. But I think I certainly don't feel like I need to have my questions, all those little details answered right now in order to, to express support for this. So I'm enthusiastic about it. Anybody else have a comment they want to offer? I mean, at this point, this doesn't even have an LD number, right, Matt? Is what she said? That, that's okay. correct. Right now, it's, uh, it's at the advisor's office, so that they'll be issuing one shortly, I believe. Um, I don't suppose anyone has had any conversation with um, Senator Carney on this, have they? I have it. No. I might try and reach out to her between now and our next meeting then. Be curious. So um, based on this discussion, do we want to put this on the March agenda or still sure. discuss it more or? I think put it on the agenda. And Chrissy may be available that evening as well, Mr. Chairman, if uh, uh, she wasn't available this evening, but uh, she may be available on March 8th, so I can, uh, and I think she was planning on attending, so if you want me to formally ask her to be uh, ready if there are additional questions, she may be prepared for that as well. Um, that's fine. I think um, if, if people have questions that they um, are looking for more answers on, maybe get them in advance to her, that might be even more helpful. Um, I, I don't want to have to do the presentation again. Not that it wasn't valuable, but I, I, I mean, I, I, um, I don't want her to attend thinking that we're expecting, you know, her to do a, a whole song and dance or anything. So if she's attending just because she's interested in the outcome of the vote, that, that's fine. But I think if, if, if people have questions in advance, we should funnel those to her and, and so that that information is known ahead of time if possible. Okay. Um, I just noticed that um, Jody Bro has her hand up. I don't know if you want to hear from somebody on this. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I, I don't mind. I mean, we're we're fine on time. Um, Jody, if Matt, I'll open up your mic in a second. Um, I know that there's the difficulty in these meeting formats about the public comment coming before the council's had a chance to discuss anything, but go ahead. And if oh. you don't mind, just including your address for us, thanks. Hi, I'm Jody Bro, and I live at 5 Wombeck Road. And I just uh, wanted to say that um, I'm a business owner here in Cape Elizabeth, Dental Lace Incorporated, and we are striving to be a zero waste uh, company. We've produced a zero waste product and our packaging is produced here in Maine by Franklin Printing, and it is a zero waste compostable product um, package. And so I guess my comment is that it is possible for businesses to make the decision that they're going to be zero waste, that they're not going to contribute to the package pollution. It is possible. It's, it's not easy. Um, and I also want to say how much I appreciate the support that you're in the comments that you've made tonight. Um, and I hope that you will um, uh, continue your support and uh, sign the resolution. Thank you. 
Thanks, Jody. Um, I'll just ask, does anybody else have any comment from members of the public? Go ahead, Laura Marston. Matt, I'll open up your mic in a minute. Go ahead, Laura. Hi, my name is Laura Marston. I live at 55 Hannaford Cove Road and I own GoGo -Go Refill in South Portland. We are New England's first zero waste store. So I spent all day talking directly to consumers who don't want any packaging. Um, there are a lot of people who are really excited about this bill and um, I'm just excited to hear people discussing it and it's really interesting to hear everyone's questions. Um, I also spend a lot of time picking up trash along 77. So I just want to <laughs> give a shout that I fully support adding that to the document previously with my children who are telling me right now that I have to mention that they are very good trash picker uppers. <laughs> so yes, thank you for considering and it's nice to hear positive comments about it. Great. Yeah. Anybody else um, with any additional thoughts or comment here? Thank you both Jody and Laura. Um, okay, so we'll plan to bring that forward on the March meeting and uh, see where that goes from there. Um, just quickly, one other thing, um, I just wanted to add for the March meeting, because obviously the big agenda item is um, the vote on the short-term rental uh, ordinances. Um, if anybody has anything, uh, I'm just gonna make a personal request. If anybody has anything that is uh, a fairly material change from where things are in the draft now, if you could come to the meeting prepared with what your hope is for that to change to, um, so that we're not um, just, truly drafting stuff on the fly. Um, and that's that's my only plea on that one. So um, I guess I'll leave it at that. Does anybody else have anything else while we're gathered? All righty. Well, thanks for your time, everybody. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Participants, the attendees.